to Phillips Mill Community Association's Art Talk. I'm Laura Womack, and with me is executive producer Jen McHugh. Hi, everyone. Today, we're talking with Bill Jersey, an impressively creative person. He's had a long career as a documentary filmmaker, covering current events and doing in-depth profiles of extraordinary people. That was his safety career. Coming from journalism and seeing what's happening in the field today, that was a bold choice and it paid off. Bill has two Emmys, three Peabody's, and was twice nominated for Oscars in addition to many other awards. But he's been an artist since he was 11 years old. He drew as an escape from a childhood in a fundamentalist home, and later as an adult, he took up painting. That was 35 years ago. The approach and values he developed as a filmmaker he employs in his paintings and his works in both areas is about discovering the world around him and sharing that with his office, uh, sorry, with his audience. Bill studied fine art at Wheaton College. He has a master's in cinema from University of Southern California, and he's produced more than a hundred films. Join us with your questions in the Q and A where we can easily find them. And Bill, welcome very much to our talk. Thank you. Uh, Bill, I want to start talking about your career as a documentarian for a couple of reasons. One, it's just fascinating to me. Uh, I'm an admirer. And two, I think it puts your, your art in context. As you developed your approach to filmmaking, you also, I, I think, I, from talking to you and looking at your work, I think you developed your approach to creative work. Um, and then we'll, we'll look at a number of paintings. Does that work for you? Absolutely. All right, good. Um, so you once told a reporter that studying art was the only thing that was acceptable to your parents. And that surprises me since the art world has such a difficult relationship with many conservative Christian communities. We're not talking about that kind of art. <laughs> We're talking about Bill Jersey's little scribbles on paper that the, my parents were very worried that I might do bad things. And once I did, I drew a picture of a naked woman when I was in my teens. I don't know what possessed me because my mother saw it and she asked me never to do that again. And, well, I have recently, but, but for a long time, I didn't know. <laughs> but you didn't, you don't think, they didn't think that art would be a corrupting influence on you? No, they thought being out in the world would be a corrupting influence. So if, if I were, instead of going to church five days a week, five times a week, uh, three days, five times a week, uh, I started going out with kids from the high school, that they would be more worried about that. I, I wasn't allowed to dance or smoke or drink or swear. And so I did a clever, I think for me, a clever thing. I bought a little camera so I could take my little camera to the dances and not only could I be at dances, I couldn't dance, but I could be at the dance. I also could charge people a dollar for a picture. So I made a living in spite of going to places where my parents did not want me to go, but they didn't mind because I was just taking pictures. I was not dancing. So we used to say at, at Houghton College, we used to say, you know, you have to be careful. Don't get involved with sex because sex leads to dancing. Right. Right. <laughs> but so they were okay with you going to art school. Uh, they were okay with me going to a Christian college and studying art. All right. I went to Houghton College in Houghton, New York. I met some absolutely wonderful people. Uh, Dr. and Mrs. Ortlip, they were named O-R-T-L-I-P. I tried to get in touch with them, but I, I, nobody knows where they are now. I think they're, I'm sure they're dead. But uh, so I know where they are. But uh, <laughs> they were wonderful. They were wonderful. They were generous. They were giving. They were patient. Uh, no, I really uh, I had a tough time in, in Houghton College. I, anxiety was, has been my companion uh, to a lesser or greater degree, and it was to a greater degree then. And uh, they were very uh, solicitous of my feelings and fears and doubts. And so it was, very, it was a good school for me. And then you went to um, a very well-respected school for uh, for film, USC, yep. and 
came out and you were doing feature films when you came out. You were working. Well, I wasn't. No, I wasn't doing feature film. I, I art directed some feature films. Um, I did one feature film, but I mainly was an art director, and I art directed the Blob, which of course anybody in Phoenixville area knows because every year in Phoenixville at the same Colonial Theater you can see the Blob which was made in 1965 and still is shown in <laughs> Phoenixville. Uh, God knows why. Well, it's, it's one of those films that's so kind of crazy weird that uh, it, it has a life, you know, it doesn't, it, it's not identified in any life, uh, period of time. So you want to go see the blob, go to the Phoenixville Theater, check it out. All right, sounds good. And I'm going to look for the art direction. But you, we were just talking uh, moments before we started, and uh, you were saying that reality is much more interesting than fiction. Yeah. Yes. Well, that's what it is for me. Um, fiction, fiction is, is always fiction, even in the great movies. You carry with you a reminder that, well, what you saw was created by some very talented writers, directors, actors, but it's not real in the way that the people in my films are real. Uh, and when you see pain in my, when you see a, a, a woman crying with her husband in a time for burning, because she doesn't know what to do about the fact that the church is all upset over the fact that Negroes might be going into their white church. And, uh, yeah. It's very, it's very touching. I'm sure an actress could could um, cry over uh, black people coming to their white church, but I doubt it would have the same effect. Right. And let's talk about that film, A Time for uh, burning. burning. And I think Jen has a, um, the cover of it. We can take a look at that. That is such a powerful film. I watched it uh, the summer of Black Lives Matter, and it's extraordinary how uh, relevant that yeah. film is today. It almost seems as if nothing has changed. Uh, yeah. Well, look at that image. And on the upper left by the A is Ernie Chambers. Ernie Chambers is an Afri African-American uh, man who was, who was a barber when I met him. Um, but of course, he finally came out that he wasn't just a barber. He was a graduate of Creighton Law School. So he was a very special barber. To the right is the, uh, to the right of A and just above time is, is, the, is the, uh, the, the minister of the church, uh, not, not the minister, the, uh, the, the guy above the minister. And he just was bewildered by what uh, Bill Youngdahl, the minister, was trying to do. He said, you know, it's just not the right time. And then way right down at the bottom is Ray Christensen. And Ray Christensen was just, couldn't believe that I wanted to, to, uh, to have th that church talk about race relations. He said, you know, we've, we've, been, we've been, this church has been here for 400 years or whatever it's been. And he said, and we've never talked about is it, I don't think it's the right time. And uh, well, in a sense, he was right. There is no right time for people who don't, who don't want to deal with their feelings toward people of another race or culture. And of course, this film is about a young minister who had come from an integrated church in New Jersey and yes. gone to Omaha, Nebraska, and yes. had initiated some integration or at least exchange between uh, a Caucasian and an African American church at the time, and it it was uh, 1965. I think that film came out. Yes, it was. And the 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 the, uh, the, the what he did was he just found an African American minister in the community and asked him if a small group of his people would talk with a small group of their people. So it was not it was not a big deal. The biggest deal was probably when, when I suggested to Bill, why don't you invite the young people? They're more, they're more likely to be open. So Bill Youngdahl, the minister, invited African-American kids from a wonderful church. You saw them in the film talking about why they were a little bewildered by white, white, what white people couldn't, couldn't uh, commute with, participate in their life with them uh, with ease, that they were uncomfortable. So, uh, they came to the church, it was about a dozen of them, 
and they sat around with the white kids and they talked. And uh, at the end, uh, the minister said, well, people came to me and said, if that's what you're gonna do to this church, we're leaving. And so people started to leave because they were afraid the church was gonna be integrated. Yeah. Uh, it's an extraordinary film. I think it was uh, the New Yorker during two, two years ago actually um, re-reviewed it or, re or went back and visited it again. So um, yeah. Jen has put the link in the chat and I recommend it to anyone. Uh, it's, a, it's an extraordinary to look at that film now. It's a great film, Bill. It's enlightening. And to see it in the context of today is great too. So I, I congratulate you on that and your many other films. Thank you. I think what's important, I do want to say, but one thing that's important about it is there is no writing that preceded action. All of the action was a fun function of reaction of communities of whites and blacks. It had nothing to, I didn't write anything for people to do. Now I did write a little narration um, that was not used as narration, it was just, I, 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 and I didn't write narration. I asked Ray to talk about his relationship with his parents who were very much against uh, black people coming into church. So I did, I, I did ask some directive questions. Uh, so it wasn't all totally spontaneous, but it was mostly just people did what they wanted to do and allowed me to take their pictures. Yeah, right, and that, that's exactly right, uh, Bill. And that's, um, I wanted to go from there into um, talking about cinema verite because you were a pioneer. You were at yeah. the forefront of cinema verite. Just as a quick side note, Jen has put a link for the New Yorker article from two years ago in the chat. So you can click on that and, and go check that out. But so you were um, a for, at the forefront of cinema verite. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd love you to talk about that because I, I feel like that goes right into your plein air painting. Yes, it does. <laughs> well, uh, the uh, Eclair company in Germany had invented a handheld camera, marvelous handheld camera, first one available. And uh, I got the second camera that was sent to this country, not the second camera made, but the second camera sent to this country I got because I knew that that was going to liberate me. Most cameramen, uh, documentarians, used a tripod. They put the camera on the tripod, then they panned it around a little, or they moved it to the next place. But this, this camera allowed us to put it on the shoulder, which I did, and I could move. In fact, I'll never forget when I was in New York doing a film for NBC, my first film for NBC. And I had a cameraman, of course, because it's, it's a uh, union shop. So uh, Joe Vidal of the camera, a wonderful little guy, he says to me, well, Bear, Bill, where do you want me to put the tripod? I said, in the crunk. And he <laughs> said, what do, you mean? what do you mean in the trunk? I said, I mean in the trunk. What do you mean, what do I mean? And uh, so he put it in the trunk and he was happy. He loved doing handheld shooting. It was the freedom, him was a short little guy and strong as an ox. And he loved running around the street with me and we would shoot everything that moved. And uh, in fact, I never, <laughs> the, the only thing that, that he, he wasn't there that day, one day it rained and the cameraman who was, NBC cameraman who was there, wasn't Joe, but another guy, he said to Bill, we're not gonna shoot in the rain, are we? I said. I am, if you're not, I will. And he said, all right, go ahead. So he gave me the camera. And I don't know whether the union ever knew that, but anyhow. So, but yeah, but it's, uh, anyhow, you said it was leading up to what question? Well, I just think that it's such, it's uh, interesting that you come from cinema verite, that you yeah. were a pioneer in that and that you, in your painting, you choose to, uh, you know, do plein air painting, which is, you know, you have to be quick because the light changes. It yeah, no, you, 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 know, you have an, about an hour. And uh, so I always take photographs before I paint and then start painting. And then if I see that the, the light change and I like the change, then I take photographs then. And when I'm, when I'm wrapping up, which is usually five or six or seven hours later, I will take pictures in just as kind of reference. But uh, <coughs> yeah, you know, it's just, it, it's always building a living relationship to whomever or whatever you want to do. You know, it's really as simple as that. It's not very complicated, I don't think. 
No, I, I love that building a relationship to whatever you want to do. And it takes coming to it with some honesty and openness, but also some courage. And I wanted to use the word faith uh, in honor of your background. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You just to, um, to let what is going to be unfold. Yes, and that was it. And so I'll tell you, there were times when my faith was very tested. In the time for burning, the Lutheran Church had hired me to do a film about the church's response to racial tensions. Fair enough. I'm interested in that. So I find somebody who's in a situation that's very tense and potentially conflicted. So because I don't want just a nice little nicey nicey thing. And uh, it turns out that, as I suspected, the congregation was not happy with this very liberal minister from New Jersey, and they kind of wanted him to slow down or move out. And uh, so I, I went back to the board of the Lutherans, and I said to the board, now look, at we didn't plan on doing a film about a minister who's going to quit over his church's response to racial tension. But that's the film we have, and you're not obliged to keep it because that wasn't what you intended and we can end it now and I'll put the, you put the footage in the can in case you want to someday want to use it and you don't need to pay me any more money and uh, it's over and out. And uh, I told you what one guy said, we'll stop this film over my dead body. And this is the guy who had a heart attack a year before. Uh, so we did not stop the film and the church bless their hearts, a very conservative Lutheran church allowed me to finish a film about a church's willingness to fire their minister because of his commitment to racial equality. Woo. Yeah. Good for them, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Good for them. Um, and it, and interesting and teaching, enlightening today too, as well. Um, yeah. Bill, let's take a look at some of your work. Um, I know people are eager to see that, as am I. Well, it's not it's not work you have to understand it. it's all play all right let's take a look at your play <laughs> yeah well this this was just a tree uh in the uh in the woods uh not far from my home and uh i just fell in love with the tree but i didn't like the fact that the limbs and the trunk all went out of frame so instead so you see the limbs are going up the limbs are going left and the trunk is going up, but there's no darkness. I made, the, I lightened the, the limbs as they went up or made them brighter as they went up in order for the eye to go to, to, the, uh, to the central trunk and from that to reach out to the, to the lower limbs. And you know, it's basically the same thing as film. You, the same thing is you try to, to try to edit a film so that the audience will go where you want them to go and see what you want them to see when you want them to see it. This is not a matter of deception. It's a matter of allowing people to discover at their own, with their own comfort level or, or to, to discover in a way they would not otherwise have discovered. I think if that tree had been painted dark all the way to the top or all the way out to the left, uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have the same effect at all. Yeah, it's interesting. I see the your challenge with the composition there. I was struck yep. by the color. I mean, the color yep. is, um, I'm going to say wild, Bill. I mean, you look at that yes. green, and then you no. go to the pinks and the aquas and the ochre yep. in, the, in the canopy. So well, that's the way I saw it. You know, you see things your way, I see things my way. <laughs> I see color in everything. I really do. And I think, you know, it's... Uh, uh, frequently I'll take pictures and then I'll take them back home, bring them back home and I will significantly off, I'll push the reds or I'll push the blues or I'll or retract the whatevers uh, and see what happens when I do that. Uh, because ult ultimately, you know, it's our, our perception is our perception. It's not the reality. It's, uh, whatever we see is our reality, not the reality. In fact, it's funny because my, as a 94 year old, old man um, my when i was about 90 i had my i think it was 90 well, anyhow i was old and i had my cataracts taken off and cat, cataracts is that right um could be sure what, what's over your eyes when you can't see well yeah, yeah that's i think cataracts they, right yeah. yeah yeah cataracts so i had cataracts taken off and all of a sudden i thought shit the world is much more colorful damn wow <laughs> what happened 
<laughs> and it was just, of course, those cataracts had uh, diffused all the, all the, the, the light. I want to move on, but I can't. I can't pass up the comment you made. That is, um, is the way I see it versus the way you see it. Because I've had that experience. Yeah. I've seen painters who paint with a lot of color, and I've gone out into the world and tried to see those colors. No. And yeah, it, it, I'm not seeing what you're seeing out there. But I love seeing through your eyes. Well, that's good. That's why I do it. All right. Good. Okay. What's up next, Jen? Uh, while she's pulling that up, I just, uh, I wanted to ask you about the Fovis, Bill. The, the Fovis? The Fovis and their sense of color. Is that an influence for you? And and here again, no. we've got some strong color with the blues in these shadows. Yeah, no, I, I'm not influenced by any group because I know if I am, I will just copy them. Although I will say that Vincent van Gogh, the hawk, he painted uh, Millet's Man with a Hoe 12 times in order to understand what Millet was trying to get at in form and color. So I think some people do it, I don't. Uh, but I do, I, I love color. And I, what I loved about this particular building, but I love the fact that the lower half of the building was a, a rather off white yellow, and the upper half of the building was off, off red orange. And I thought, that's really great. And then of course, when the shadows came in, I thought, well, all the shadows are going to be blue on my painting. And, uh, so it, it becomes a red, yellow, and blue, you know, the basic color spectrum. Yeah. There's a few little green thrown in there and the, the trunk of the tree. But that's a Prolesville Mill on uh, whatever it is in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, that's where I had my big show, which is right very, very. it's also a, an interesting perspective bill i mean we're, we're yes. it's like we're standing right at the foot of this of prawlsville mill yep. Yep. or stover mill which one which, uh, i'm not sure which one and uh prawlsville, prawlsville okay you know when, or is it stover oh god you know what caption I, no I it's stover it's stover you're right it's stover mill okay yeah, uh stover. it's like we're standing right at the foot of it looking up and this yeah. is you know, again, it's kind of a photographic perspective. You and I have talked about this. <laughs> yes, indeed it is. <laughs> okay. All right, go ahead. Tell us about that. Well, the thing is, you know, photography is just a mechanical means of doing something more quickly that you did more slowly with your paints, with your oils or your watercolors. Uh, I mean, I always looked at, the, at an angle that would reveal the character of the thing I wanted to paint. And to me, I wanted to, paint this as a kind of, of, of um, what's the word, word I want? It, 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 the height of it, it, was, it, was, it wasn't quite that high, uh, you know, it wasn't that, or that skinny. But I wanted to emphasize that because that's the way I saw it. And I, I love that mill. And it's, it's, a, it's a mill that has art shows. That's where I had my 57 painting sale in five weekends. Uh, so I'm very fond of that, of the Stover Mill. And you should I invite anybody who's in the area to go to Stover Mill because they every month they have a new artist uh, in their in the mill. It's it's a great place to go see art. It is a great place to go see art and some great artists. We heard you had a great show there, had a lot of sales. I think it was a good summer for yes. um, yeah, and I'm happy for that. And we've got uh, Dennis Riley who produced this uh, particular show. And Sue Ann Rainey, who's well known in our community. Oh, yes. Sue Ann. Confirming yes. Stover's Mill. Uh, yes. And I'm thinking David Hewitt is also going to agree with us. So, yes, good. <laughs> uh, so, there you go. Okay. But I also wanted, so you mentioned before uh, that you wanted to have it from that perspective. It was a photographic perspective, but you talk about that you, uh, you're a plein air painter and you do take notes from photographs. And it's, I know it's a contentious issue for artists about whether you paint from photographs or not. So where do you where do you come in on that? <laughs> At 94 years old, it's not a contentious issue. <laughs> I work from photographs. Okay. All right. And but you still no, but go I out. Used to, no, I do think there's no question about looking at a photograph, you're looking at a two-dimensional image. You go out, you're looking at a three-dimensional image, and it's a different experience. And it's a different way of seeing, and it's different. I respond to it differently. I much prefer to go out. 
but uh, now it's it's not possible. So uh, now it's back to the. But I but happily I'm I'm working from a lot of photographs I, I took um, when I was not a cripple. No, when I was I'm able to walk out uh, among the fields. So uh, like this one behind me here, that one there, that was a that was a photograph I took of at. Um, at um, no idea what's the name of that place. We're, we're Washington Cross, the Washington Crossing. Right. At Washington Crossing, there's this little house that uh, was there, I guess, when, when old George took his little boat ride across the, the river. But uh, I just love the slope and, and I love the colors of the, and as you can see in that one, you know, I'm, I'm not tyrannized by actual colors. The tree to the far left uh, in my picture, I don't know. Right there. Yeah, we that, can see it. Yeah, that you know that wasn't that color. That was more like these. But uh, I like contrast. I like I like to not only invite but kind of pressure people to move into a frame where I want them to move, and then move back and down and up. So I use color. I use uh, value, uh, light and dark, composition, whatever. Right. Okay, Jen, let's take a look at the next, I believe we've got rising clouds coming up. Um, I, I think this is just such a lovely painting as it comes up. Uh, there's beautiful color in the shadows, um, the reflecting those trees. Yes, happily, I'm happy to show this because I sold this one and happily I sold it to, to a, a dear friend because uh, I love it. I, when I saw these clouds, and they, they're pretty much the way they were. I didn't do much much cheating. The color in them, well, that's me. But uh, the shape of the clouds moving up was just so, I thought, so wonderful. It's like, that's why I call it rising clouds or clouds rising. Uh, <coughs> and I couldn't, I, I just, I sat there. I, I think I'm, I'm sure I painted it from a photograph because I'm sure it didn't stay there that long. But uh, and the relationship between the clouds and the and the uh, shrubs, and uh, the, the blue of the sky and the warmth of the fields. That they, they, it's everything is in. It's all about relationship, and you see that's that's where it was in film too. Well, I was always concerned about the relationship between the individuals I was filming, and people who lived in their neighborhood or went to their church or fought them in court or whatever, but the relationship between individuals and the relationship between elements in your painting. It's analogous, it's not literally the same, but it certainly is analogous. And getting those relationships right, uh, putting the, as I, as I call it, putting the emphasis, emphasis on the right syllable, uh, <laughs> because it's, it's, it's really, every time you put a brush stroke down, you're liable to distract from what it is you want. Now you notice the edge of that cloud Notice the blue in the sky is much darker. It's, you know, that's not a work of genius, but it is how I drew you to the edge of that cloud. I wanted you to see the edge of that cloud and how it turned back uh, into the sky. And there's a lot of color in that painting as they should have been. There is a lot of color. And on first instance, the first viewing it, you see the color of the sky itself. But yeah, then when you yeah. look at those clouds, you're just drawn in by those luscious yeah. yellows and greens that are in there. It's really, it's nice, Bill. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. All right, um, morning light, I believe we have next. Uh, this, this was an interesting painting for me because that's what it looked like to me. Now it's true that all of the, all of the limbs that go up in the air were not blue. They, they had, some were in shadow, some were in light, but they, most of them were dark. Like the, the, see that one section of the, uh, of the painting where, where it's very dark? Well, though, that's where the darkness of, the, of all of the limbs, the, the shadows were dark. This was a bright sunny day and uh, the shadows were dark. And then I looked at it and I said, no, 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 no. All of those little limbs are fighting. What I want you to see, I want you to see the trunks I want you to get your eye down to the trunks. And so not only did I get rid of all the black on the bows on the uh, limbs up in the air, I also added the shadows. 
uh, on the ground. So it's, it's always what, you know, I'm always asking myself the question when it comes to people, I ask myself, what, 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 what needs to happen here in order for this, or this event to be understood? What, 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 are the, what do people need to see? What do they need to hear? And in, in when, when my art, I say, what needs to happen so the eye will go where I want it to go? I did not want the eye to be stuck up in the limbs, even though the limbs occupy almost a third of the whole space. So I added some shadows on the, on the, uh, on the uh, grass, and I also made the grass a little brighter than it actually was. It wasn't quite that yellow, but uh, so it's always a matter of enhancing or enriching what's there uh, for me, uh, rather than trying to in invent something that isn't there. Now I I'm, I'm admire those who can totally paint things out of their head and, they don't need any trees or fields of green like I do. But uh, I love that. I also love the fact that when I set up my paintings, I set up about 60 paintings in uh, Stover Mill and I sold uh, 47 of them. And this was the first sale. And uh, I was so happy that this was my first sale because I really, I'm really very fond of this picture. I don't know why you picked it, but I'm very fond of this picture because it's so much me. And so little it, uh, you know, the, 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 the dark, the shadow on the far right was, wasn't anywhere near that dark. The blue shadow along the path wasn't quite that blue. And the limbs, as I said, were all dark, uh, almost black. And now I've made them just blue. So it, it's, it's trying to take, and, and it's, it's, that's what I did with film too. You try and take what's given, take the given, and say, what can I do to make the given be seen more richly and more in, engaging, more, more interesting, interesting? Yeah, I get what you're saying that when, as you're, I think in film, you're using editing to sort of highlight and, uh, you know, put emphasis, emphasis. And on framing. It. When you're shooting, you frame. Do you frame? Do you, do you take this picture or do you take this picture? Do yeah. you take it when it's here or do you take when it's over here? It's, it's very different, the angle and the composition in a, in a film. So very frequently I'm, I'm, I'm here because that's all I want you to pay attention to. But in, 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 in the time for burning, you'll notice one of the men is, is like slouched over. Well, it was important to see his slouch, you know, not just his face, however meaningful that might have been. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, and in this painting or in your painting, you're using color shadow to draw the eye and edit it a little bit, as it were. Jen, if mm -hmm. we could just see that picture one more time quickly and then we'll we'll go on to the next painting. But I just want to point out um, there's a, a dab of just very strong red. If you've got a big screen, <laughs> yes. you see it. It's uh, yeah, there we go. Yeah. It's a little I, I was just. It's, it's at the foot admiring okay. bill of this red. at the foot of, at the foot of the tree you mean the foot or of the tree the but also in the branches this big yeah, right strong there, branch you that's right yes yes see yeah. now that you know why yeah i have no idea why <laughs> it, i just said you know it needs something here what does it need more green no we got green elsewhere more yellow no it's in shadow well then what how about red red's good <laughs> yeah, well, and it it changes the whole character of that it, shadow. I'm I'm in love with that red. No, it really does. Yeah. All right, Jen, what do we have? Morning. Oh, morning. that's Vermont. That's Vermont. Oh, generations. Yes. Yes. Tell us about this, Bill. Well, that's a long, a lot of long, long, long story for that. That was one of my earlier paintings. Uh, uh, we were in Vermont and I was bored and my wife said to me, why don't you go buy some paints and paint? You used to paint. So I bought some paints and started painting in Vermont and I loved Vermont. First place, I love the people of Vermont. I love what they do with their land and with their home. I mean, this is, this is a painting of one, two, three, four, five, six barns. Today, only two of those barns exist. And they were falling down as I was painting them. And I knew that this was, a, this was an end of an era, these, all these wonderful old barns in Vermont. And I don't know how many there are left, but I'll show you. There's not anywhere near as many as there were when I painted this. Also, I love light and shade. I love to find something in a, in a picture 
that I can really have a strong light and shade so that the eye has somewhere, is invited to, to begin somewhere. And so this, the, uh, the roof, roof casts that nice shadow above the barn entrance. And uh, so that's where I started. I started with the, with the, with the shadow of the, uh, of the, bar, of the barn uh, roof. Uh, and then I put in the, the greens because, because they were there, but also I love the fact that the, the, that the, uh, the, the vine is crawling up the, up the po post on the, on the uh, porch and it's actually going to go onto the, it probably went onto the roof and they probably just cut it off so it, they didn't want it cutting into the rooftop. But uh, I, I love this painting and I, while I was painting it, uh, one of the farmers came out. Do you have that picture of me with the with the uh, of, of, no of the six kids and the farmer, or no? We don't have that one. Sorry, no. Bill. Yeah, I'm sorry. I should. Anyhow, so I'm painting this, and, and uh, two little kids come out as they do, and they said, "Oh boy!" And I said, "Why don't you go get some crayons and you draw while I paint?" And so they did, and then their parents saw them, so they came out. And then the the two word the two older boys that were working they came out, so I had I had the four kids and the two moms and they all had dirty dungarees on. They were working. They weren't they weren't there to have their picture taken, but they let me take their picture. They were happy, in fact. And then I gave them an, another version of this for painting, and uh, because I I love giving I love giving paintings away. I tell you I'm. I have I don't know how many dozens of paintings I've given away because it's incredible how much people appreciate getting a, a, a an oil painting or even acrylic painting uh, from you. So uh, I encourage my artist friends to feel free about giving away some of their work. Don't uh, don't put too price in your head or or put a high price in your head, but say that the people who let you fill, uh, paint their barns or their houses. Uh, deserve it. Yeah, they do. That's, that's really nice, Bill. Um, uh, I, I like to hear that. Uh, Jen, I want to talk about that painting a little bit. Um, sorry, can we go back to it, please? You were talking, Bill, about the, um, you like the strong uh, contrast in, in uh, light and dark, and that yes. helps people find a way in. Yes. And we see it here. And in a lot of your landscapes, you're, it looks to me like you're painting at high noon, which of course for photography is not a good time. No. Um, but do you, when do you paint and when you go out? I, I prefer to paint between uh, eight and 11 and four and six. So this one may have been the exception, you know, sometimes. You, I, I, and, and, and incidentally, it isn't when I paint, it's because it, it, I may take the photographs and go home and repaint it. It was like, might have, you know, this one, this one is, was painted at this time of day. And, and I like the shadow at, at this time of day. So, you know, it, it, it must have been something about what I liked about this time of day. It was the shadow and the white buildings and yes. the dark entrance. You know, that just jumped out at me. I, I was going to paint that no matter what. Yeah, your eye goes right there. And yep. so now when I was reading about you, someone said that um, described your work as Hopper-esque and yes. they quoted you as liking Hopper, Edward Hopper. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I, and copied... I see it here, I think, yeah. Oh, sure. I copied Edward Hopper paintings dozens of times just to practice. He, in fact, uh, was it, no, what was Hopper? It was Van Gogh. But uh, anyhow, yeah, I thought his work is just wonderful. All right, good. And and I think here this, um, I'm trying to think of the name of that painting uh, he did of this, the building on the street with the windows and the harsh shadow. Um, anyway, this makes me think of that. So um, next one, please. I think we're gonna, here we well, go. That, that, here's, here's what my son thinks I should always do. This is a palette knife. There were no brushes used in the making of this painting. There was nothing but palette knife. So it's all heavily textured uh, palette knife. But, but once again, you know, it's finding something to get the eye to go to and then travel. So I feel the eye is bought, goes to the little house because it's surrounded by dark and right below it is the bright path, which then moves up to the right and it carries you into the trees. Uh, 
But, but what I particularly liked about this was the, uh, the way I treated the field, which was essentially one color. It was essentially a kind of warm uh, yellow ochre. But uh, that was boring. So I decided I would introduce whatever I wanted wherever I wanted it. So I put shadows where I wanted them. I put green where I wanted it. I put purple where I wanted it. And uh, so this painting, this, this is almost one of the more radical, uh, forget what nature gave you, you can do better. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> my motto. <laughs> well, and again, you've got the amazing color. You've got these uh, lavenders and mauves and oh, yeah. uh, bright yeah. colors in the, in the grass, but you also have, I mean, your your so called shaded trees are yes. just a riot of yes. you know, middle blues. I mean, you're not even going necessarily for dark blues, and your purples no. and yeah, and, yeah, green. That one, the tree on the right is purple, green, yellow ochre, and four other colors. I don't know what the colors are, but. Uh, well, I, I can't say I disagree with your son. I think he's got something there. It's a nice painting. <laughs> Yeah. No, and I, I want to do. invite anybody in the audience too. If you have a question for Bill Jersey, we're having a nice time having a chat, but please put a question in the Q&A um, and we will give you a chance to ask Bill a question. Okay, next painting, please. Oh, ah, oh you're yeah. here in your studio. Yes, there I am. Uh... We love seeing the places where artists do their work. And uh, this is looks very pleasant environment, Bill. <laughs> well, my poor wife had to give up her uh, living room, dining room, uh, for me to paint her living room, actually, uh, because that's this little house on the on the canal. This was the living room, and now we have our living room in in our kitchen. But uh, it works, and she's gracious enough to allow me to have this big space, which is very bright, as you can see. It's all existing light. And to the left is my chair with my computer. And to the right, out of frame, I guess, yes, is, a, is my Eames chair, which uh, is my absolute all-time favorite chair. I did a film on Charles and Ray Eames. Um, and uh, when I saw that a friend of mine in Minnesota had an Eames chair, I said, I want to buy that. And he, said, and he said, well, I'm moving, so you can have it from $400. I said, oh, goody, it's worth 2000 but uh, I was happy to take it for 400 Yeah, It's a great yeah. chair, great chair. It is a great chair. And uh, yeah. of course he was a master and I, my neighbor had one when we were growing up and I've always yeah. been fond of those. You're very fortunate. Yeah. We do have- well, a I, I, If you can get the film, it's, it's called Eames, the architect and the painter. He was an architect, she was a painter. But uh, it's, 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 I think it's a very good film. It's a 90 minute film, we got some awards. But it's mainly, it's, he's a, they, he was a very, they were a very interesting complex couple. He was not a very loyal husband, um, but he was, he was a very interesting complex guy, Charles Eames. And she was very interesting too. Yeah, that film is on my um, to watch list. Yeah. So I'll, I'll see if I can, I can find it. Jen, we, I think we have a comment in the chat or a comment question. We do. Um, April said, uh, well, her question was, do you work darks to lights, top to bottom, middle to edge? Can you talk about your work <laughs> style? And then she said, by the way, I'm in love with your palette. <laughs> That's good. Well, I am too. So that makes two of us. Uh, no, I work from center of interest out, whatever it is that really, I think really, it's where I want the eye to go. That's where I start painting. Then I work out from that up or down or over or left, never from light to dark or dark to light. I, I just think that, that that's not what the painting is about. The painting of, is about is something that mattered to me that I saw that I wanted to capture. And I wanted to capture. So sometimes I, I always work with a white canvas, which I don't recommend incidentally, because if you put a light gray on a, on a white canvas, it looks like a dark gray. So, but it does, for some cockamamie reason, I like to work with a white canvas, and, uh, but I don't recommend it. Uh and so you, we, did we, did we cover all the points there, Jen, with the, 
darks to lights and which working across the canvas? I think so. Well, she asked about your work style, Bill. Uh, it's impulsive, obsessive, uh, impatient, committed, delighted, frightened, confused. <laughs> you know, I go through the whole thing. That's why my wife prefers if I start painting at 10 o'clock at night, which frequently I do. And I'll paint from 10 to 12 or two. Um, but I also, well, actually she goes to bed at nine. So I will start at nine, but uh, it's all right. We have separate rooms. So I'm, I'm allowed to paint here whenever I want. But uh, it is true that uh, somehow the, the night, the quiet of the night, the separation from distractions of the night. It's even when it's literally true, it's great. And when it's metaphorically true, it's, it's great. All right, very good. Let's go back to some paintings. Jen, what, uh, what is up next? And while she pulls that up, I'm gonna ask you, uh, what is your, what's your favorite movie, Bill? Favorite movie? <laughs> you mean that I've done? Yeah. Uh, probably a time for burning just because it was a chance to really get involved with people's lives in the, in the most tense and difficult and awkward situations possible. And that the way they let me into their lives and in a way, and I knew, I knew that what I was dealing with was not a transient situation. It was not something that was going to be gone in six months. I had a feeling that the the racial tension in this country was going to last for a long time. And it's now, tragically, it's basically the same as it was in 1965 in many places. You see, as the white people are trying to uh, restructure the polling so that they don't have not too many Negroes are, are voting. Uh, you know, it's just, it's a very sad situation. And it's very much like what was going on in, in that church. Now this painting is a painting that I made. I, I love the farm. It's a farm up here in Pennsylvania and it's called Morning Light. And it was, I just love the way that the warmth of the sun just coming up on a winter's day. So the, 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 the snow is still blue from, from the, uh, the, the sky, but the, but the warm light is hitting the buildings. And I love that it's a group of buildings. Anyhow, I really, it's one of my favorite paintings so I sold it at the, at the Stover Mill and I sold it for whom? Guess, my granddaughter. I thought my granddaughter, she can't afford to spend this kind of money, but I didn't stop her. So she bought it and she's delighted with it. And she put it in her home. It's a big painting, 24 by 36. And she put it in among, and I love that it's among all of her plants. There's something wonderful about all of her plants with my painting of bare trees. But anyhow, so I was very happy she bought it. I gave her a couple of little paintings uh, as a thank you. But uh, that's, that's that painting, it's in her home, in her apartment, little apartment in. Uh... And that's a wonderful story and a wonderful painting. Um, we have a couple more questions for you, Bill, from the attendees, okay. Jen. Uh, yes, Joe wants to know, do you work out your compositions with sketches first or do you dive right into the canvas? I dive right into the canvas. No, sometimes I will sketch, I will sketch the, the principal diagonal movements, you know, on the, but not on a pad. I sketch it right on the canvas uh, with uh, charcoal so I can wipe it off if I don't like it. But uh, yeah, sometimes, and sometimes I wish I hadn't, I didn't. So I had to re repaint and get it back to what I saw in the first place. But uh, yeah, I, I like to, just just the basic, basic things, the basic line of the, uh, of the, of the road, the rough shapes of the, of the trees, where the, where the building is going to be put, you know, a few basic things that, uh, what it is I think that's essential to the composition. Uh, I do, I do sketch those in. Are you a quick painter, Bill? Well, I don't do plein air anymore because I'm too old. But uh, yes, I used to, well, you have to be quick if you do plein air. It's, within an hour, everything's changed. So I always, my paintings, plein air paintings, seldom took more than three hours. 
sometimes four or five, but usually in the fourth or fifth hour, I'm just kind of heightening the, uh, the bright, bright gets brighter, the dark gets darker, uh, the grays get pushed back or, or colors get warmed up. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's plein air is, is not the time for slow pokes, not the style for slow pokes. Right. Well, we've got more questions coming in, Bill. So um, back to okay. you. Uh, Carol Ann asked, how does Bucks County stack up against other locales that you have painted? Oh, that's a very good question because every area is very different. Uh, Vermont was some, an embarrassment of riches for hills and, uh, and valleys and trees, green trees mostly. Uh, What's nice about Bucks is it's an incredible variety. I can, with driving within 50 miles, I can get to wonderful streams, lakes, hills, valleys. I can't get to mountains, that's true. Um, the mountains, I have to go further west or further north. But uh, yeah, I just think Bucks, Bucks County is a, uh, is a great place to paint. It's really, it is, as I'm fond of saying, an embarrassment of riches, and we just need to take advantage uh, of, of what's here, and, and to try and try to bring something new to to all. You know, that's that's always a challenge for me, and I think it's a good challenge. I, ha I happily engage with, which is to go back to places you've painted before. There's one. You have one of those paintings of my 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 barns, my barns with the light on the top of the barn because this is a painting I've painted seven times and uh, not as many as Van Gogh with his man with a hoe, but uh, maybe maybe more than that, maybe 10 times. You know right. what I'm talking about? She, she's looking for that. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to take over the Q&A while she's pulling that up. Um, mm -hmm. And Claudia asks, why do you think uh, do you, why don't you paint people or portraits? <laughs> because people, if they if if they have a nose, they have a nose that looks like their nose. They don't have a nose that looks like the tree, you know. So I, the problem with people is that they are what they are, and they can't I can't manipulate them to be something they're not. Although God knows some artists did uh, in extremis, but uh, I have I painted a few, and I packed I painted a couple of people's fathers for their kids. But uh, I'm not good at figures. I wish I were, but I'm not. Uh, so that's why. All right. And Ellen Antonison asks, do you get the same satisfaction from painting as you do with cinema? Is the satisfaction similar or do they complement each other? They're very different, but they complement each other, yes. And I do I get great satisfaction from both. The satisfaction from film, of course, takes longer. Uh, you know, the satisfaction from art can take me two hours. Film can take me two years. So it's a, it's a very different domain of satisfaction, but it is, it's, what makes it satisfying is I'm always, I'm always reaching. I'm always trying to, to get insight into characters that, that they don't even know. I remember I did a film on a family in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And, and uh, when I left it after two weeks of filming there, I said to the, to the woman, the wife and the family, I said, you know, I, I know I was very intrusive. I put lights in every room and uh, you know, my camera's constantly poking away at you. And, and uh, she said, oh, she said, we talked about things we never talked about before since you were here. And I thought, shit, that's good. That's what it should be. Nice. So uh, yeah, so that was nice. And then we have a comment from Stana saying, thank you, Bill, for being such an important part of the Stover Mill last year. That's great. Well, nice. thanks, Silver Mill, and uh, all the folks who made it possible. You know, they sit there, uh, a different person, every day for the 10 days I was there. And every and she she or he mostly she's volunteers and doesn't get paid for it. So I thank you and thank the place and uh, and thank you for being there. You know I've never had that many sales, so I know that I know that it's partly my work, of course, hopefully, but it's also the place. You know, an environment creates a mood to invoke or provoke actions. 
either positive or negative. And that, that mill provoked positive reaction. You look out the window in the mill and there's the river flowing by. That's when people would come in the door, I would say, don't look at the paintings, go look at the river. Because I mean, if they look at the river, they'll be so inspired and empowered, they'll come look at my paintings and they'll like them. So I don't know whether that's true or not. <laughs> that's an interesting hell. strategy, but it, it also it is, it's lovely. Yeah, I like it's, that. It's um, so Bill, you, you started out in your career as a painter being more realistic and you oh, yeah. become more interpretive. And you've talked yeah. about how uh, you change, you know, very specifically you change things. And I just wonder yeah. if the, if in a way uh, painting is more freeing for you because you're really, it's your voice now rather than recording other people's voices. Yes, that's absolutely true. And that's also a tyranny. The, the, the wonderful thing about doing documentary films is even if you're not very good, if the people in front of you are doing great things, you can shoot them, you know? You don't have to be great. You just have to be the right place at the right time. Uh, well, a little more than that. But in painting, you know, it's the wonderful, the tyranny and the, delight of what's possible uh, you know you make the make make the make the red tree blue if you want for <laughs> so, the, so you know and also it's there's something about being able to just do it by yourself uh, I, I, that, that is both wonderful and terrible I'll never forget being in Alaska I was doing a film but I also took my easel and canvas with me and so I'm out on the tundra and it's a beautiful and incredibly beautiful scene in Northern Alaska, uh, the hills and the, with snow on them and everything, beautiful, beautiful. So um, this is a natural, I can't miss on this. So I put my canvas, I put, I put my easel up, put a canvas on and I start to paint and it's terrible. So I wipe that off and I start again and it's terrible. And I finally say, I'm not gonna do this. I can't do this anymore. And I grab the canvas and I throw it across the tundra and I say to no one there, because there wasn't anybody there, I will never paint again. And I didn't paint for three years, but to, because I just, I couldn't do it. I knew I couldn't do it. I couldn't paint that. There's just some things, some scenes that I can't paint and some people paint them beautifully, but. Uh, well, Bill, um, I, that's an interesting note to end on. I've so enjoyed this conversation with you and the kudos are coming in. Uh, Jen, you wanna share the last one from Terry? Sure, Terry uh, said, please tell Bill he is as colorful and joyful as his paintings. I have thoroughly oh, enjoyed great. listening to him and looking at his artwork. Tell her I want it in writing. <laughs> Oh, okay, well, we'll get it to you. We'll get it to you in writing. <laughs> okay, you know, you can't do any better than the, than the host allows you to do. So thank you <laughs> to, to uh, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, I think I'm blushing now. Thank you. This has been a pleasure. Um, okay. I enjoyed it so much. I really appreciate it. And um, and I also want to uh, thank you for Phillips Mill for the work you're doing as the juror of the Youth Art Exhibition. Yeah, We're really yeah. excited about that. You want to give us a, a little peek about, you know, do we have a good show coming up? Oh, of course you have a good show coming up and you have given me an impossible task. 126 drawings, paintings, whatever's. And you know, almost every, them, every one of them have something to recommend them. That's a tyranny of large numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we'll struggle our way through and make selections. Well, good luck with that. I did take a Thanks. peek and I think it's a nice show. Bill Jersey, show. thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us. We um, are looking forward to our next youth art show special on Art Talk. We're, uh, we are having a pre-recorded, a special video that uh, Jen McHugh and Dennis Riley are working on with the youth art team. Uh, mm -hmm. So please join us for that. Jen McHugh is our executive producer. Thank you, Jen. Of course. Dennis Riley is our content producer today. And Jean Mihich is a content producer for Art Talk. She's working on some good shows for you in the future. I'm your host, Laura Womack, and everyone have a good evening. <laughs> <laughs>